Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for turning up today. So about um, 10 years ago, I you know, went into the philosophy department one morning, and there was a phone message waiting for me in my mailbox that said, uh, could I please call the home office, uh, the Department of Gaming, Liquor, and Data Protection. Uh, so I picked up the phone with a bit of trepidation, expecting to get ticked off for something I'd done wrong. Um, but instead, they asked me whether I wanted to take part in a review of gambling law that was taking place in the UK. And uh, this review was uh, going to be chaired by someone who was, has become a bit more famous than he was even then, uh, Alan Budd, who was in the news recently in relation to the Office of Budget Responsibility. So they asked me if I wanted to take part in this. And you know, immediately I knew I was going to say yes. But you know, I had to pretend to think about it. Um, so I said, well, what would it involve? And they said, well, there'll be about 10 meetings. Um, and the documents will all be drafted by, civil, by the civil servants, the support units. I might have to look at a few drafts of things. Oh, and by the way, I will probably have to go on about 10 site visits to gambling establishments as, uh, as part of it. So I thought, mm, yeah, okay, okay, uh, I'll do it. Um, and so I did, uh, and I joined what became known, in fact, was already known as the Gambling Review Body, which was uh, set up by then the Home Office, as I said, and the idea was to review British gambling law in the light of a number of developments, which uh, I'll mention as I go on. And um, as I arrived in the committee, expecting really just be, to sit there, go to the meetings, um, I, I was told immediately that actually that wasn't what my job was going to be. Um, we really had to get involved in understanding gambling law, which I knew nothing about, gambling practice, which I knew a little bit, a bit about, but not very much. And we were going to take evidence as well. And so the chair said, we're going to ask people for evidence, we're going to set some questions, and uh, you know, we should all have a courtesy of reading all the evidence that comes in. So I thought, yes, of course. If people are going to the trouble of writing evidence, then we should uh, read it. So anyway, uh, the deadline went and came, and um, the evidence arrived, and I put it in a pile, and it came up to my waist, roughly speaking. And every gambling company had employed PR consultants to send evidence in, and we probably got about 150 submissions. Many of these were bound, 150-page treatises on gambling law and how things should be changed. And uh, in the event, uh, instead of just going to 10 meetings and 10 visits, which I did do very enjoyably, actually I particularly recommend the dog track if you're <laughs> wondering how to spend some time. Um, but uh, I probably spent most of my research time for about 18 months thinking about gambling law and gambling regulations. But the evidence as it came in was um, interesting at first and then very repetitive. And one of the very last things I read was a bit of evidence, a letter, a few pages from a man called Peter Collins, who was professor of gambling studies at the University of Salford, and one of the very few academics actually employed on gambling studies. And he said that he didn't really know why we were asking for evidence. Because what we would have is you know, a lot of gambling companies writing in saying that the law should be reformed in such a way that they personally could do more, but no one else should be able to come into the industry. Church groups would write in saying why gambling should be more restricted. And academics would write in, and I was expecting to, you know, you know with an objective analysis. Uh, but what Peter said, academics would write in saying, we don't know enough in this area and need more money for research. Right? <laughs> um, and he was right. The, the, every bit of evidence fell into these categories. And since then, I've been more or less continually on working parties of various sorts, some of them commissioned by Academy of Medical Sciences, Nuffield Council. Um, and in virtually every case, we've made the recommendation that we don't know enough and we must put more money into research in this area. <laughs> 
And so now uh, I make it a point of principle. I say the, last, the only thing I'm going to say in advance is I don't want to make a recommendation that we need more money for research. I'm always overruled on that issue. So we, we need more money for research, apparently. And actually, in the case of gambling, it was true that almost no money had been spent on research. I mean, it's very interesting to think about how research priorities are set. So that a lot of people had thought gambling was a social problem or could be a social problem. So what were we doing as a country or as an academic community to study the problems of gambling or the nature of gambling? Well, in the course of our report, we found that... Um, there, when we started, uh, there was a pilot study in Sheffield funded by the NHS for about £25,000 looking at problem gambling. Within a few months, we, would, we got a letter saying actually the NHS had pulled the plug on this and it had stopped. And that was the only public money we could find in the country going into studying gambling at all. So there were half a dozen academics, but most of them were funded by the gambling industry one way or another or were funded just out of university resources, out of QR money. So there was no research going on of any significance in gambling in the UK. And um, the few academics involved in this or on the fringes said, you know, drew the comparison with drugs. There's, you know, there, there's a problem with gambling, problem with drugs. Millions, hundreds of millions are going into drug research. Almost nothing is going into gambling research. Nothing is going into gambling research. So there was sort of drug research envy going on in the gambling community. Um, a few years later, I was on a committee looking into the regulation of recreational drugs. Uh, guess what we recommended? Um, we, we didn't have gambling envy. We had US envy on that one. And all this money in the US was going studying drugs. We, we were doing very little in the UK by comparison. In fact, uh, what, what happened in, in that case was that um, a fair amount of money was going into the study of drugs in various ways, epidemiology, into try to study the effects of drugs. But what was interesting was that there were almost no results from this study. That money was going in and nothing was coming out the other end, as far as I could see, or very little that was usable was coming out the other end. Now, just to give an illustration of this, um, the, the chairman of the, uh, that committee, Gabriel Horn, who's a very eminent scientist, so he thought that one thing we needed to know on this committee was what harm, what physical harm do various drugs do to you? Okay, this seems like quite a sensible question. If you're thinking about regulating drugs, you need to know what harm they do. So you know, he uh, started with the, you know, let's try the most serious case, the most obvious case. What does heroin do to you? Well, all the encyclopedias he looked at told you about the dangers of overdose and how easy it was to overdose. They told you about um, opportunistic infections from injecting. So we know about that, HIV, hepatitis. You can kill yourself if you take too much. You can get infections if you inject it the wrong way. What about someone who just takes it from clean needles and never overdoses. What's that going to do to their health? Well, no one has answered that question, as far as we could tell. We couldn't find any source that said what a regular, clean, controlled dose of heroin would do to you physically. It would be addictive, we knew that, but would it kill you? I mean, Keith Richards is saying it's a miracle he's alive. Um, it, maybe he's just read the government's publicity about what heroin does to you. And, uh, you know, when, when I was uh, at school, we were told that if you take heroin once, you'll be immediately addicted and dead within seven years. So don't do it. Um, well, that doesn't appear to be true. Or if it is true, no one knows that. And you can see the difficulty here, because you could hardly do a you know, randomized clinical trial on the harms of heroin. Um, it's very hard doing observational trials for things that are against the law, that don't bring people into contact with the law, or don't bring them into trouble, and so on. So it turned out that we've got almost no knowledge about what harms these different drugs do to you, despite spending all this money on research. Now, you may think we know some things, and, you know, maybe the things that we now know that uh, were not available when I was looking at this, or were looking in the wrong places, but you know, we had 
some of the country's leading experts on the committee, and we took evidence from other experts. And it was just astonishing that you know, people would do um, experiments, they'd put you know, people in an fMRI scan and detect a tiny difference. But you might have a subject group of eight people, four in the experimental arm and four in the control arm. Because after all, it's expensive, the fMRI. You can't get time on it. So you do a little bit, you get a tiny effect, the university's press office gets hold of it and suddenly you've cured cancer or whatever it is. But you've shown this tiny thing and which gets blown out for all proportion and you look at the studies and they show almost nothing. So this was shocking. Lots of money was going into studying things, almost nothing was coming out the other end, as far as I could see. But even when there were results, um, it is very hard to know how to interpret them. So one area in the case of drugs where uh, there are uh, significant usable numbers is in so epidemiology, where you can plot um, overall population trends and you can look for correlations between different data sources, di different variables. Now this was quite interesting because there are some well-known correlations. For example, there's a correlation between cannabis use, heavy cannabis use, and schizophrenia. There's a correlation for you. So a lot of people think this shows that uh, cannabis use causes schizophrenia. But you know, in our first year methodology classes, the first thing you tell people is correlation doesn't mean causation. Right? But when people are thinking about their own results, they forget what they're teaching their students and so jump to, well, actually it's not true that the scientists jump to this, but people who see the statistics. And so you get these correlations, but you get conflicting correlations. So supposedly there is a, well, it has been shown there's a correlation between heavy cannabis use and schizophrenia. There's also a chart that someone produced that um, I, I saw where you, you see cannabis use going up over the last 20 years, and what happens to schizophrenia goes down over the same period. Okay, so what does that show? Who knows what it shows? Right, but it, it, it shows that you know, your first statistic seems to not to correlate very well with your second one. Um, there was another statistic we had where, um, so the death records um, are kept where by, if there's a post-mortem and there's a drug in someone's system, then this appears on the death certificate. So anyone who dies with ecstasy in their blood, this will count as an ecstasy death. Although practice varies, so statistics aren't kept the same way. So I showed some of the, these figures about the number of ecstasy deaths in the UK to a statistician. And he said, there's not enough of them. I don't know, what are you talking about? He said, well, in that age group, there ought to be more deaths than that. Because statistically, you know, people of that age group, they die in fights, they get stabbed, they die in car crashes, they have accidents in the home, so um, there should be a higher number of deaths. So even though there are 12 deaths or 20 deaths or 30 actually deaths a year, depending on which version of statistics you use, there ought to be more than that. I.e., it looks like XC on this interpretation is protective of your health. <laughs> Why? Well, because if you take it, you don't get into fights, you don't, you don't get drunk, uh, you might be taking it at a club where there's a nurse present, so, uh, and so on. So it may well be we should be encouraging our children to take ecstasy rather than <laughs> doing other things, uh, give, given this evidence. Um, but in any case, um, this, this is the issue about how do you interpret this data. You've got the data, um, you, know, you can use it in all sorts of ways, but yeah, even, if, even if it's hard fact in the terms of numbers, it's always going to be debatable what it shows. And even then, um, there are other problems with it. So in the case of drugs, there are a number of people, because there's no data on, sorry, gambling, in the case of gambling, because there's no data on, uh, or until recently, there was very little data on problem gambling and the effects of different types of gambling on problem gambling in the UK, people use figures from the US and, and warnings from the US. So at the time when um, we were thinking in this country of introducing resort casinos, that, by the way, wasn't one of our recommendations on my, my committee. We recommended something much worse than that. But anyway, um, we, uh, uh, but when, we, when resort casinos or super casinos were under consideration, there hadn't been one in the UK. So what would happen? 
So people used statistics from America and Australia and South Africa where super casinos had been brought in and problem gambling rates went, went and rocketed through the roof, supposedly. Okay. So this was meant to be a warning about what would happen in the UK if we introduced resort casinos. But this was nonsense because in all of these other countries they were introducing large-scale casinos against a background where there had been no legalized gambling before. Whereas in the UK, we are saturated with gambling opportunities. I mean, on your way home, you'll probably pass half a dozen bookies without the slightest temptation to go in. Um, if they were called super casino, would that change things for you? Would you suddenly find yourself drawn in because they were... Maybe, maybe, maybe once. Right. But we have a, yeah, a completely different background to gambling in this country than in the US. We even allow our children to do it legally. Okay, so you may not have, have realized this, but we are possibly the only developed country which, allow, which legally allows children to gamble. So if you go to the seaside arcades, there are fruit machines, slot machines, and those machines called penny fools or pusher machines, where you put in tuppence, and you might get fourpence back if you're lucky. Okay. Well, that's gambling. Okay. And in other countries, that would be illegal for children. But we encourage our children. We think that's a good use of their time yeah, <laughs> when, when they're at the seaside. We think, actually, that's much better than the slot machines. But it's the same thing. And th those crane machines, you know, remember? Those things with the fluffy toys in. And you put some money in, and you try to pick them up with a crane. Well, that's a ga you may not know this, I didn't know this, that's a gambling machine because the crane has a random grip on it. So you might think you've done all the right things and you pull the fluffy toy up and then it loosens its grip like this. So there's an element of skill, so if you don't have any skill you won't guess it, but it's not determined by skill, so that's a gambling game. So we allow our children to do this and we don't think anything of it. So we've got children who've grown up with gambling, they're gambling all over the place, What's going to happen if we open big casinos? Nothing much, probably. It would just cannibalize the existing market. People who are gambling in a different way will go and gamble that way, possibly. Or it will cause huge problems, possibly. But the fact that introducing casinos in South Africa where there hadn't been any legalized gambling before, the fact that that caused problems, is no reason to think the same thing would cause problems here. So even where you do have evidence, translating it from one context to another is highly problematic. Okay. So anyway, I, um, so really a diversion about evidence, but I think it's quite important to think about how evidence can feed into policy making, or not in this case, because it's so difficult to see that anything actually means anything. So anyway, they asked me if I would join this committee on looking at gambling law. I said yes. And not only did I say yes, I thought, I can sort this out. Right. No problem. I'm a trained philosopher. It should be very easy for me to work out how to regulate gambling law. Because after all, I've read John Stuart Mill. <laughs> and um, John Stuart Mill says that you know, the only reason to interfere with the liberty of any person is to prevent harm to others. Their own good is not a sufficient reason. So I went in thinking, I can, it's not going to take long. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to work this out. And then I thought, hang on a second. Do I actually believe this? Do I believe that the only reason government can interfere with people's liberty is to prevent harm to other people and not harm to the people themselves? Because, I mean, to think what that would mean in the context of gambling. Now, um, in this country, we have, or had, we, we've, our, our committee made some small reforms. So um, we, we were very restrictive in this country about what you could do. So I don't know if uh, 10 years ago any of you tried to play bingo. I did, and, uh, yeah, and, um, because I was living around the corner from bingo hall, and I thought that would be fun to see what goes on in there. So uh, you know, with some friends, we went around, thought we'd have a great time. And we had to apply for membership of the, of the bingo hall. And they said, and it takes 48 hours to process. You can't just come in. I said, that's ridiculous business practice. Why would you do that? They said, no, it's not a business practice. That's the law. That if you want to play bingo at that time, you had to apply for membership for the club and then go home for 48 hours to reflect on your decision 
see wh whether, you, whether you had made a mature enough decision that you were worthy of going to play bingo. Right? Um, and you know, this was true for casinos as well. So you, you couldn't just walk in. You had to be a member. And being a member of one casino wasn't enough to be a member of another one. You had to apply for each one individually. So, so my cousin, who a traveling salesman, went to lots of casinos. In his wallet, he had about 20 membership cards for different casinos and different uh, towns he visited. What would John Stuart Mill say about this? Well, the Liberty Principle say, would say, this is ridiculous because you're stopping people doing things they want. They're not going to harm anyone else. Now, you might think they do harm other people. I come back to that. But they're not going to harm anyone else. You can't restrict their liberty. So the Liberty Principle um, says that you can't restrict people in this way. What did John Stuart Mill actually say about gambling? Well, just by chance, I, I found that he, as a young man, in his teens, actually, he wrote a letter to the Lancet in the um, first year of the Lancet publication. He wrote an anonymous letter. In fact, uh, we had the Lancet lecture last night, and I spoke to the editor of the Lancet to ask him if he knew that John Stuart Mill had published a letter in the Lancet, and they didn't know about this. So it's quite good. First year, 1823. And John Stuart Mill wrote a letter to the Lancet warning about the, gate, the dangers of gambling and how it corrupts individual character and is bad for the person who's gambling. Right. According to the Liberty Principle, of course, Mill was much older when he wrote the Liberty Principle, but according to the Liberty Principle, that's irrelevant. You know, if people want to harm themselves, that's their business. So if you believe in the Liberty Principle, you should say, why don't we have this sort of gambling machine? You just put your credit card in to a slot machine and carry on until you run out of credit on your credit card. <laughs> no country allows that. No country allows people to gamble on their credit card, as far as I know. You might be able to go to the cash point and withdraw money on your credit card and use it, but, but no country will allow that. In, in this country, up, even now, I think, in a casino, there's a, a brass rail on the ground, a sort of line on the ground, that separates the bar area from the gaming area. And you're not allowed to take your drink across this brass bar. The, the, the drinks are in one place and the gambling is in another. In the US it's different. You know, they encourage you to, ga to drink while you're gambling. In the UK we think that's probably not very sensible. Um, it's very sensible for the casino to encourage this, not very sensible for the punter. So we don't allow it. Why? To stop the person losing money. So we do all these things to protect people from themselves. So, so I realized this within about 10 minutes of sitting down on this committee. It was going to be a bit harder than I thought here. Because I thought we could just appeal to a philosophical principle to solve this problem. And it would be the liberty principle. Um, but I could have tried to do that. I could have said, well, the truth about this is John Stuart Mill, the liberty principle, blah, 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 blah. We have to take all restrictions off. Well, what reception would I have received by the other people on the committee if I'd said that? Now, I thought they would have been respectful for about five minutes. Um, but you know, if, if I said, you know, we have to follow this principle, the reaction I would have gotten, got to other things, was, well, who says we have to follow this principle? If I said, well, John Stuart Mill says, uh, well, as, well, part of my training as a philosopher is that I'm not meant to argue from authority. You know, you're meant to argue from the strength of the argument, not, not authority. Um, so what argument did Mill give? Well, you better get back, I'll get back to you on that one because I couldn't remember. And he doesn't. I mean, he just gives you the principle. Right? He tells you this principle. And you find it compelling or you don't. And the truth is people find it compelling just because they don't think about the consequences of it. And you have you know, contemporary politicians occasionally appealing to Mill's principle and then doing something highly paternalistic the next day. So, you know, we don't believe in these principles. And, indeed, you find, as a philosopher, getting involved with these type of public policy issues, the um, training one has as a philosopher cannot be applied in any straightforward way. So you know, we, we learn philosophical theories, we teach these theories to others, we teach them as uh, options that you could take. But as soon as you get into a discussion with other people, everything changes. And the sorts of things that change are uh, you know, numerous, but here's just a few of the, the salient points. 
So in all these public policy issues, there is a type of deference to the status quo, how things are now. Because public policy is always about what changes are we going to make. It's never about what would we do if we were starting from nowhere. And this is difficult for political philosophers, moral philosophers. Uh, one political philosopher, Jeremy Waldron, uh, who's just moving to Oxford, said that you know, a lot of political philosophers write as if they're engaged on the project of answering the question, um, you know, I expect you'd all want to know what I would do if I ruled the world. Right. Well, actually, no one wants to know what you'd do if you ruled the world. <laughs> um, well, maybe they do. Maybe you're really brilliant and it would be worth listening to. But we're not, you know, the world is not going to conform to your will here. The world is not going to change itself just because you've got the best theory. So, we, so there's a, always, the starting point is always the status quo. And you have to justify changes. And it's always harder to justify changes than not doing anything. So the status quo always has a privileged position in the argument. No philosopher will like this. But in public policy debates, that's where we are. The second thing is that as a philosopher, um, so being a philosopher is largely a solitary business. You do this on your own, um, in front of your computer in your room with your books. Every now and again, you take your views and you present them to other people, and they disagree with you. And, and they tell you why you're wrong. And you tell them why you're right, and then they tell you why you're wrong. And um, if we find we start agreeing, this is extremely boring. And so we look for the disagreements rather than the agreements. So part of the process of philosophy is to try to move things um, apart. So we concentrate on minor disagreements. Freud has this term, the narcissism of minor difference. Well, this is what happens in most academic disciplines, I think. What's much more important is how your view is different to everyone else's and how it's the same. So you could have 99% agreement. It's that 1% disagreement that you concentrate on. And then at the end of the seminar series, you know, no one says, well, what have we learned, friends? This, uh, let's write a, a joint minute on what we've done here. You just go away still thinking you're right and everyone else is wrong. Although what you think was your view might have actually started off as someone else's view and so on. But in any case, um, we, the, the result in philosophy is always you agree to disagree. But in these public policy debates, you can't do that. You've somehow got to bring yourself into consensus with others. You've got to compromise. And our training doesn't encourage this at all. The reverse, actually. Our training is to be uncompromising. So that's the second thing. The first thing is there's a preference to the status quo. The second is that there's no room for agreeing to disagree. You have to come up with a joint view. Third thing I want to say is that um, in Philosophy classes, when we're teaching first-year students ethics, most of them um, assume some sort of subjectivist view about values or relativistic view about values. That is, you know, what you think is up to you. Uh, there's no truth here. Um, and we spend about two or three years trying to explain to students that that is a theory about ethics, not the only truth about it. And there are other views, too. And maybe there is truth in ethics. And maybe it's not just up to you what you think. And yeah, eventually they get the message. But when you go into the public policy arena, most of these people haven't gone through that education. And they're still subjectivists or relativists of some sort. And you can tell them that they're wrong about that. Or you can tell them that's a philosophical theory. But you, know, you don't have the two years to try and drum it out of them. And in any case, you know, they're, your, they're your equals, not your students. And so they don't have to listen to you at this point. So what counts in these public policy debates is not whether you have the objective truth or you're arguing from the authority of John Stuart Mill, but whether people will, whether what you say makes sense to people given what they already think. That is, what you have to do is build on, try to build on the values people already have. And in one way, this isn't too difficult because people do broadly agree on the same values, it seems to me. So everyone thinks... You, Autonomy is important. Everyone thinks the general good is important. Where people differ is on what weight they give to these different values when they come into conflict. In these cases, it's actually very hard to come up with any argument to show that one value is the right one in, in the particular case. I mean, maybe in some cases it is obviously right to put one thing above another, but very often you can't do that. And you can say, well, there are a number of different values we're going to have to compromise. We're going to have to see if we can come up with a scheme where most people can get most of what they want. 
and how can we arrange regulations for that? So what matters is trying to get some sort of drawing people into a consensus rather than saying, I've got the truth, listen to me. I mean, it is really tempting. You know, where, where if they would say, you know, you give them a view and they say, well, who says? And they say, well, I do. They say, well, who are you? I'm the philosopher. You invited me onto this committee. Why did you invite me on if you're not going to listen to what I say? Right. But, you know, I never actually did that because I thought <laughs> it wouldn't go down very well. Okay, a couple of other points. So in the philosophy seminar, if you can convict your opponent of inconsistency, you've won. Okay, that's the only thing we've got, showing your opponent's view is inconsistent. And then there's no reply to that, unless they can wriggle out of it some way. In public policy, if a public policy is inconsistent, that just turns into an interesting fact <laughs> about it, um, you know, rather than a refutation. And the, and the best example of this is in relation to drug laws. So David Nutt has been going on for the last 10 years about the inconsistency in our drug laws because ecstasy and cannabis is, are illegal and alcohol and tobacco, which do much more harm, are not. And I think the general view is, among scientists, he's right about the relative harms. So from a, a philosopher's point of view, you know, if alcohol is legal and ecstasy is not as harmful as alcohol, then surely we should treat both the same. They should both be illegal or both be legal. In public policy, the argument that I've heard a couple of times now is that the fact that alcohol is, is so harmful is a reason for keeping ecstasy illegal, even if it's less harmful. Why is that? Well, if we're already allowing all this harm, why would we want to allow any more, even if it's, even if it's smaller? And, you know, there's something to this. That the fact that something, a new form of pollution is less polluting than one we already allow is not necessarily a reason for allowing it. You say, well, we're stuck, actually, with that. We're stuck where we are with alcohol, but we can stop introducing more harms. So inconsistency is a very weak thing in public policy. Of course, if a law told you to do something and not to do it, that would be a problem. But treating ecstasy and alcohol differently is not a problem. Finally, um, for political philosophers, quite often we think if there's a problem, in fact, the ordinary person thinks this as well, if there's a problem, the answer to it is generally to pass a law of some sort. Okay. Well, if that was a solution, the prisons would be empty. Okay. Um, it's one thing to pass a law, it's another thing to get people to obey it. And what happened in the case of gambling, the reason why gambling became legal in this country was that they couldn't enforce the laws against it. That off-track gambling was, il was illegal, but apparently one in four of the adult population were gambling illegally every month. So if you read these novels, realistic novels of the 1950s, there's this character called the Bookies Runner, who is always being chased over garden fences by the Rosers. Okay, so you know, this is illegal gambling taking place on a massive sort of industrial scale. And the police, in the end, thought it brought no credit to the law to have a, a law that people wouldn't obey. So you need to think about whether actually if you do pass a law, will people obey it? Because if you, if you pass a law and people don't obey it, you've increased the number of problems you've got rather than reducing them. And this was a sort of shock to, to see this, although having put it like that, it seems now quite obvious. Okay, so what do we do then as, as philosophers? We can't apply theories. Um, you know, no one's going to listen to us if we're saying anything outlandish. A lot of our theories are irrelevant. Well, what we have to do is what anyone has to do, really, which is just understand the subject matter in front of you. So you've been called in because there is a dilemma of some sort. You really need to understand how that dilemma arises. You know, what is the problem you're looking at? Why do people think this is a difficulty that needs some resolution? And when you've done that, you can just think really hard about it. And now, as a philosopher, one has a training where this is what you do. I mean, you think hard about problems and you think about distinctions and arguments and ways of reframing the question, ways perhaps of bringing other considerations in. This is not to say that philosophers are the only people that can do that, uh, although in my experience, a lot of people can't do this. And so a lot of people who are in other areas, like most academics can do this. You don't have to be... Uh, yeah, uh, only a philosopher. So people with other academic backgrounds can do it. But a lot of people who've achieved quite a high level in public life one way or another have never really had to think very hard about distinctions between intellectual positions. Um, so there are things we can contribute. And also, of course, as philosophers, we can do this informed by thousands of years, two thousands of years of thought on these topics and similar ones. But in the types of committees that I've been involved with, 
in a way, they, this is philosophical work of a type of low ambition. Because you start from where you are, you can't bring in ideals, you need to try to work out compromises. So the way what you're doing is responding to values people have. But there's another task for the philosopher, which may be more important, and most philosophers will find this more comfortable, which is to do what philosophers do. Think hard about issues and answer the question about what you would do if you were in charge. That is, try to come up with your, your own view of what is right in this area rather than what you can get by. And in doing that, maybe next time there's a discussion of that issue, values will have shifted a bit. So in the short term, what you have to do is try to respond to existing values. In the longer term, what one tries to do is reshape the value environment so that you can bring new ideas. And, and we see that sometimes it takes 200 years. So you know, various um, yeah, arguments made about the emancipation of women, for example, would have been completely irrelevant to put forward in the policy debates of the 1790s. Um, should people, Mary Wollstonecraft and others, should they have just shut up then because they couldn't affect the current environment? No, obviously not. They should have carried on doing what they're doing, even though their work wouldn't come to any you know, fruition for you know, 100 years or more. Which, if this was about the impact agenda, uh, you, you think about the way in which impact in the humanities works. It's not on a five-year time scale, generally. Um, but anyway, I, so I want to say that within, within philosophy, there's a short-term work to be done, responding to values, trying to help people out of dilemmas, trying to give people as much as they can. Um, in a consensus, and there's also the longer term dilemmas uh, issue of where we try to shape the values that will be around next time the issue comes up for discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Wolf. We do have about five minutes for questions, uh, so raise your hands. When I call on you, uh, please wait until one of these uh, kind people with a microphone has gotten to you so that your voice can be held for all posterity. Uh, I, I saw a first hand, uh, there we go, the gentleman in the blue sweater. Thank you very much, that was really good. Um, not so much on the philosophy side, but maybe more on the, on the policy side, on gambling. Um, I think one of the things I found interesting or, or curious at the time was that the majority of policies, decisions at least, that come from politicians are either, either come up because they're very popular or they're necessary or mm -hmm. ideally both. The strange thing about gambling reform and I guess especially super casinos is there didn't seem to be any popular desire yeah. for it um, and it also didn't seem to be necessary. So, I mean the cynical interpretation is it was driven by big business but um, is, is that what you think? Or, I just yeah. There seemed to be, it was very curious because there was no yeah. reason for it. Well, um, the, the reason why we were um, called in for review of gambling law wasn't to bring in super casinos. I mean, that was never part of explicit or inexplicit brief. The, the, the reason why there was a need for reform was the, um, if you go back to the 1950s when gambling was illegal in the UK, it created all these problems. So the government decided the right thing to do was to make it legal in a highly regulated form, but not to encourage it. Okay. So if it existed, you could create a casino in some places or gambling. So they had this concept of unstimulated demand. Right. So it's actually, it was very like prostitution. The thought was that this is something that shouldn't really exist in a civilized society, but it's going to. So we better make sure it happens in a way that keeps crime out as much as we can, gives people a fair deal, and so on. Um, so if you wanted to open a casino or a betting shop, you had to show there was already demand for it. Therefore, you couldn't advertise. So in that era, most casinos were not allowed to put a sign outside that said casino. Right? So you had to somehow know that was a casino before you applied for membership for it. Uh, so until very recently, there was no TV advertising for gambling, no, uh, or very limited magazine advertising. But the government violated its own rules by introducing the National Lottery and stimulating gambling like crazy. And the gambling industry had this veiled threat to take the government to the European Competition Court. Um, 
because of unfair competition. And various other things, aspects of gambling law were not compliant with human rights law anymore. So there was a type of lag behind. So they just said, well, this is an opportunity to review the whole thing. The other thing they were scared about was the internet and how do you regulate uh, gambling on the internet. And yeah, here it was quite interesting because we just completely failed to anticipate what would happen. We thought computers would be turned into slot machines. In fact, hardly anyone has put slot machines on computers. And you have uh, poker as the uh, game of choice, which we didn't anticipate. But anyway, that was why we did it. And then the super casinos, you're absolutely right. Um, it was business lobbying government after our report came in. So, you know, we, we wrote our report. We didn't recommend super casinos. In fact, we recommended there should be a free market subject to local authority approval because we thought that would keep casinos small because the point about super casinos is they need a local monopoly. Now, Atlantic City works because there are no casinos in New York City. But if there were casinos in New York City, no one would go to Atlantic City. So we thought if it had competition, then it would just be like betting shops. These would be small things and not a problem. But the government ignored our recommendation. They were lobbied by two or three academics who were used as advisors at numerous stages in the process, who had worked in South Africa before and pointed out that super casinos would be a great way of raising revenue, modernizing Britain, call Britannia, all of this stuff. But you're right, there was absolutely no public support for it. It, it was imposed by government and business and it faded away, and I haven't heard a single person say, what a shame. Uh, no, we, we should have had them. I'm afraid that's actually all the time oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this afternoon. So, uh, before yeah. we do one last round of applause, let me mention uh, Thursday's lunchtime lecture, which is Light and Darkness in the Accelerating Universe by Professor Lahav from Physics and Astronomy. Thank you very much. One more round.